Be still and know that I am God, says our Lord of heaven and earth. On this beautiful Memorial Day Sunday, on Trinity Sunday, may we know that God's presence is with us here, surrounding us with promises and blessings and love and hope. May we know that good news and may we pause from the busyness for a moment to, to receive that great love and welcome from God here in this place. Good morning and welcome to worship here at Bon Air Presbyterian Church. My name is Alex Krieger. I'm one of the pastors here at Bon Air Presbyterian. And it's my joy and privilege to worship with you all this Sunday. Um, along with it being Memorial Day weekend, this Sunday and the church calendar year is Trinity Sunday. It's a day we remember that God, our creator, God, our savior, God, our sustainer is always with us that God and, and God's very being is relationship and that we are called and invited into that same relationship and full life with God. So this is one of my favorite days and, and joyful days and so glad to be with you all. Um, we also have a couple joyful things in the service this day, including baptism and Bibles for our children. Um, we're really excited for all of that. Uh, there are some things in life of the church we want to share. You all got the great memo. I hope you all got it and didn't come at 8.30 this morning and just stuck around for an hour and a half. But uh, you all got the memo that uh, this is the first Sunday for the summer that we're, we're transitioning to 10 a.m. worship. And that will be uh, in the sanctuary here at 10 a.m. all summer long through the end of August. Um, and we hope you'll join us here. Also, starting next Sunday, we will be having Worship in the Woods. That is a short 30-minute service in our, in our woods in the back of the church. We have a beautiful outdoor uh, worship space back there. Uh, every service is uh, very casual. Uh, we have benches and chairs and blankets out. Uh, we'll have musical instruments. We do communion in a circle. We have time for silence. So it's a very short message out there. Um, and just much more uh, with uh, very relaxed. It's a really great one for summer with families that might want some space for the kids too. So we invite you, come out for that. Uh, I'm really excited to get back to worship in the woods this summer uh, and hope you'll join us for that or here at 10 a.m. Um, 
Uh, next Saturday is our open trunk food drive. Uh, we invite you to bring food items into that, any non-perishable items, and that will go to Bainbridge. Um, on June 16th, we'll be celebrating our graduates. So if uh, I know a number of you have shared with Pastor Rebecca um, the graduates in your own life. Um, if you have not done so yet, please do so so we can lift them up on June 16th. On Monday, June 3rd, we have the Risk Celebration at uh, Church of the Redeemer, um, and we hope you'll join us for that. We'll have a carpool uh, leaving here at 6 p.m., so we invite you maybe come about 5.45, 5.50. Um, they should have told me 5.30. That would have helped them. Um, sorry, that was a joke about my lateness. Um, and then uh, there's some other things in the bulletin, but at this time, on this beautiful day, let us stand and join together as we join in our call to worship. <clears throat> Friends, let us praise God the Creator, who is filled with glory and power, with holiness and splendor. Let us worship God the Savior, who is filled with love and compassion, with justice and peace. Let us experience God the Spirit, who fills us with faith and joy, with love and eternal life.
trusting in the grace and mercy of God, let us confess our sins against God and one another using the prayer of confession printed in your bulletin, followed by a time of silent confession. Let us pray. Holy and triune God, you alone live in perfect relationship, one God in three persons, mutual and loving, ever seeking reconciliation and unity. We confess that our relationships are imperfect and we are incomplete without you. We are selfish and greedy. We are anxious and resenting. We have allowed sin to drive us apart from one another and from you. Draw us close and bind us together in your mercy. May we long for wholeness and peace. May we strive towards gratitude and grace. Forgive us and restore us. In the saving name of your Son, Jesus Christ, by the working power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. The mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. It is with great joy this day that we get to welcome a new member to this church and welcome into the family of God, a new child of God. And so at this time, I invite forward Suzanne and Patrick and David. Yeah. And if you all will stand over here. This side. This window road. Yeah. yeah. It is a joy not only to get to baptize David, who is very comfortable right now, uh, <laughs> but also welcome Patrick into the life of this church. Um, Suzanne, as many of you know, grew up here in this church um, and has been supported through this church and is still a member. And it's really joyful that Patrick, um, uh, I know we had a, a conversation a little while ago and one of the things was I was really excited for this not just to be Patrick coming to Suzanne's church, but for this to be Patrick's community of faith and church family too. And so we're very excited with that this day. Patrick, I'm going to invite you to take a step forward. And Patrick, I first have a, a couple questions for you. The first question for you is, do you desire to join as a member of Bon Air Presbyterian Church this day? If so, say, I do. I do. Will you be a faithful member of this congregation? Will you share in its worship and mission through your prayers and your gifts, your study and service? And will you fulfill your calling to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? If so, say, I will with God's help. I will with God's help. And now, for you all, as members of this congregation, I invite you as loudly as you can to show your support and welcome for Patrick with these questions. First, do you as members of the Church of Jesus Christ promise to guide and nurture Patrick by word and by deed, with love and with prayer? If so, please say, we do. Will you encourage him to know and follow Christ and welcome him fully into the life, fellowship, and community of the church? If so, say, we will. We will. At this time, I'm going to invite Patrick come forward, and I'll invite, if you are able, to raise a hand out and join with me in offering Patrick a blessing. Patrick, you are a beloved child of God. 
and you as many gifts and talents and the Holy Spirit working in and through you. You have known God's love for a while and been a part of God's body and church, and now we are excited that you are part of our community of faith. We ask that you, that through God, you may be fully welcomed here to build community, to grow in faith, to know God and neighbor clo more closely, and to discover your own gifts for service to God in this world. We ask as well that, Lord, that the Lord guide us in welcoming you and serving and nurturing, and that God also opens us to see the gifts within you, to know that you are not only served by us, but that you will serve us as well, and to see the new ways that through you, our body of Christ will grow and be blessed. May God walk with you this day and each and every day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And now we come for the blessing for David. David, for you, Jesus, our Savior, came into this world. For you, Jesus lived and showed God's love. For you, he suffered on Calvary and cried at the last, it is accomplished. For you, Jesus triumphed over death. And for you, Jesus rose in new life. For you, Jesus reigns at God's right hand and prays each day. All this Jesus has done for you, David. And though you may not know it yet, but we, as your church family, will continue to tell you this good news until it becomes your own. On behalf of the session of Bonaire Presbyterian Church, I present David Winterode, son of Suzanne and Patrick, to be presented for baptism. And at this time, I'd like to invite Barbara Jaycox to come forward as a representative of the church. Our first questions are for the whole church. Uh, along as you made promises to Patrick, you also are making promises this day to David that as we celebrate, we are also promising that this is not a one-off, but that David here will be nurtured in faith and in love, surrounded by community in both good days and, and in hard days, that he will know he is never alone. So the first question to you all is, will we help David remember that God loves him and that we love him? If so, can we say, we will? we will? The second question is, do you, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture David by word and by deed, with love and with prayer? If so, say, we do. We do. And will you encourage him to know and follow Christ and to be a faithful member of Christ's Church? If so, say, we will. we will. And now, for the parents, as well as the church nurturing him and God, you also are making a promise this day to surround David with love and faith and to tell him the good news that he is loved by God. So the first question is, do you desire that David be baptized this day? We do. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? If so, say, we do. we do. Do you turn towards Jesus Christ and accept him as Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and in his love? If so, say, we do. We do. And will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word, showing his love, and teaching this faith to David, your child? If so, say, we will, with God's help. We will, with God's help. Let us pray. Holy Lord, we give you thanks for your grace revealed through water. Before time, at the beginning of creation, your Holy Spirit moved across the face of the deep, dark waters. And from chaos, you brought forth light and land. In the waters of the Jordan River, your son Jesus came to be baptized. 
in. Sorry, David, I'm going to probably wake you up. <laughs> David Winter Road, I baptize you this day in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. David, you are a beloved child of God and you are a part of God's big family. Know each day that you are loved and treasured, and you are never alone. Amen. At this time, we will walk with David, and you can keep on him. And we'll walk, and if you can, just give a wave, wave to him and a blessing. And if you can give a sign of welcoming him into the family of God. David, we welcome you into God's family, and as a sign of that welcome, Barbara Jaycox presents you with a certificate and also a children's Bible that we, help, that we hope will help him grow in faith and in love. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we invite you all, after worship, they will be, they're going to go out with us at the post and they'll be in the parlor. And that will be a good place to welcome them and to greet them into the, the church. This time, I invite all of our young disciples to come forward for a time just for you. Come on down, friends. I haven't seen you in a while. I was gone last week. Good morning. It's so great to see you all. Come on down. Hey. 
Good morning, good morning. It's so great to see you all. I'm going to stand because I've got to move around a little bit. Isn't this wonderful? This is our baptismal font. You guys just saw David being baptized. I did. Yeah. All right, you can touch it and then have a seat, okay? Let's have a seat because we've got some other important things to do. Yeah. All right, I know. Let's have a seat. So we just witnessed a baptism, which is a wonderful thing for our church family to experience because it's a welcoming in of someone to the, the life of faith that we all share together. And it's a sign of the covenant that God has with us that we will be God's people and God will be our God. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. But that's not the only thing that we do in order to further our relationship with God. Another thing that we do is that we uh, read our Bible, right? Who all has ever read a Bible? Anyone? We read parts of a Bible, maybe heard a Bible story. Yeah. So knowing the Bible is pretty important to our life of faith because it helps us understand God a little bit better. So what we're going to do today is we're going to give some of our older elementary school aged kids a Bible. So if you just finished or are about to finish the third, the fourth, or the fifth grade, we are going to present you with the Bible. Now that means that not everybody today up here is going to get a Bible, but that's okay because we have other Bibles. And when you finish third grade or fourth grade or fifth grade, you will get a Bible. So I have a whole stack here, and Pastor Alex and I are going to pass these around, and let's maybe sit on our bottoms. Can we sit on our bottoms, please? So the kids who aren't here, I'm still going to read their name out so that we can honor them. Millie Lombard, who just finished third grade. Caroline Trainer, who just finished third grade. Ilana Berklin, who also finished third grade. We have Henry Trainer, who finished fourth grade. Lee Motley, who finished fifth grade. Almost finished fifth grade. <laughs> and Isabella Lopez, who is about to finish fifth grade as well. So these Bibles are for, just for you to have, to read, to study, to ask questions about, to know God a little bit better. So let's, fr let's pray. Will you pray with me? Dear God, Dear God thank, you for your words. thank you for your words. Help us use your words, Help us use your words. To, get to, know you to get to know you and to show your love. And to show your love. Amen. Amen. All right, friends. It's so great to see you all, and you are welcome to stay in here or go with Miss Kelly um, to child care. Please join me in the prayer for illumination, reading the bold words. Holy, holy, holy one, guide us by the spirit of truth to hear the word of life you speak and to give all glory, honor, and praise to your threefold name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Our first scripture reading today is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of glory. 
the pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth and with it said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. This is the word of the Lord. Most of the time when we read Isaiah chapter 6, we stop with those wonderful words that Linda just shared. Um, They're some of my favorites. Later we'll sing a a hymn that we probably all know very well based on this, the Here I Am, Lord. Um, And that first part is so encouraging, so hopeful of this person who, uh, Isaiah, who doesn't feel worthy of speaking for God, being cleansed with the lips and tongue and given a message and told you can go and speak for God. And then we usually stop there, and before we get to what actually Isaiah has to speak and what that that challenge is, which is a pretty great challenge, because what Isaiah is told next is that what he is going to speak is not going to be heard well by his people, that he is going to speak words of challenge and of just judgment and justice and ways of living far different from the ways they are now, And people aren't going to be that open to it, especially at first. That's a hard message to hear. Through hearing these words through Isaiah, though, may we maybe hear our own challenge and how we are called to speak and act for God's love and truth and justice. And may we also hear some good news at the very end that even when it seems like all has failed, like there's been no success, that there is still a seed planted for the future with this good work. Let's listen again for the word of the Lord. And the Lord said, Go and say to this people, Keep listening, but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. Make the mind of this people dull, and stop their eyes, uh, stop their ears and shut their eyes so that they may not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and comprehend with their minds and turn and be healed. And then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is utterly desolate until the Lord sends everyone far away And vast is the emptiness in the midst of the land. Even if a tenth part remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth of an oak whose stump remains standing when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, the week after Easter, I got the great privilege through Pastor Rebecca and through many here in the church to take a week off uh, to go for uh, a conference, a retreat at Montreat Conference Center. Uh, many of you have been to Montreat and know it's this beautiful place. And this retreat was absolutely wonderful. It was a retreat centered on different spiritual practices with different tracks going through. You could do yoga. You could do um, you could do art. Uh, you, my track was hiking, which was perfect for me and perfect for out there in the woods. And every morning, we had morning devotions together, led by Brian McLaren. Um, some of you may have read some books by Brian McLaren. He's written many books on Christian faith and spirituality, including We Make the Road by Walking, The Great Spiritual Migration, A Generous Orthodoxy, and Faith After Doubt. 
Each morning, he offered about a 30-minute devotion that invited us with things, with a message, but also things to ponder as we went through our days and different practices. On the second morning, Brian was speaking about a lot of conversations he'd been having with friends. Many of his friends were people with great hearts who very much want to change the world for good. They are pastors and community leaders. They are teachers and activists. They're social workers and parents and grandparents and neighbors and church members and people who want to speak and act and do things that will change the world and see results. They've been pouring themselves into a lot of this work to make our world a better place, both for the present and for their children and grandchildren and the future generations. But in these conversations with Brian, each one had same question, same, same theme. They kept sharing with him that they were tired, that we are drained, that we are coming up again and again against brick walls with our work and with our message, that we keep pouring ourselves out, and yet the world doesn't always seem to want to listen or be changed right away. Probably many of us know that feeling ourselves as we have served and spoken up. And one by one, they kept asking Brian the same question. Should we keep trying? Should we keep doing this work? Should we keep speaking up? Or has the world told us its answer? Has the world told us, you tried, now it's time to stop? Is it, is it time to just, it's not worth it anymore? And Brian had an interesting response to this question, different than what I might have said. He didn't say to them what I would have expected, words like, well, if you just change up your words or your strategy or how you're doing it, then you'll find more success with people. He didn't say, just give it time and you will break through. He didn't say, well, it will will happen. You'll see results. He didn't say any of that. Instead, he spoke pretty honestly to them and to us. He said, sometimes the world doesn't hear. He said, we can't control how the world is going to respond to our actions and our words. We can't always force people to come along with us. And the work of justice and faithfulness and righteousness, it's not always going to be successful in its own time. He admitted that's hard. That's very difficult. That's challenging. And At times, it can make us want to say, I'm done, I've had enough. But Brian reframed the question, and he said, our question with this work, with this challenge, with this calling to speak up and to act for God's God's message, for God's kingdom, for God's love and mercy and justice for our neighbors, isn't, are we successful by the world's kind of standards? Our question is, who do we want to be? Do we want to be people who simply go along with the world? Who go along with the world even when we see the evils within it? Even when we see violence and war and poverty and equality, racism and exclusion? Do we want to go along with it because it's easier or simpler or it, sometimes we just kind of get more people listening Or do we want to be people who stand up and speak out for what we know is good and righteous and loving? Do we want to be people who continue to be shaped and changed and challenged by God even when it's so hard, even when we don't see results? Do we want to be people who continue to do and say what we know is right even when we might be standing all by ourselves? That is our question, and that is our calling. Our reading for today finds the prophet Isaiah in a very similar place. He's called by God to speak, which sounds great, and (laughs) I love that message, here I am, Lord. But then we get to what that speaking is, and it probably sounds a lot less great on the service. Isaiah is called to speak to his own community, to people of faith, And tell them that 
they're not doing things right. That they've gone against God's dreams for this world. He's called to tell them that they've chosen greed and self-interest over community and equality. They have worshipped idols of wealth and gain over God's steadfast love. He's told to proclaim to them the ways they have fought and stolen and shed bloodshed instead of, instead of sought after peace and reconciliation and true community and shalom. Those are already challenging words, and Isaiah's probably hoping to hear from this, well, you'll say it, but you'll see immediate results. You'll see change. You'll see lives and this, this, this people shaped and healed and changed right away. But then God says to Isaiah, not only are you called to speak these hard and challenging words, but when you do so, even your own people aren't going to want to listen. They're going to stop their ears. They're going to close their eyes. They're going to go along with what's comfortable, with what they've known. For whatever reason, we at times find it easier to go with what we've known, to go with where things already are, than to hear the message of God and the prophets of God. If I were Isaiah, I would have found it very tempting to say no to God. I would have said, well, that doesn't sound like a great calling. God me saying these words and then not getting results. I'm not sure this is a great plan. But that's not what Isaiah says. Instead, Isaiah hears this call and he says, Here I am, Lord. Use me. Even with this challenge, even with myself not being a perfect person, I choose to follow you. And throughout his ministry, Isaiah speaks up. Speaks up for neighbors who have had their vineyards and their land and their lives taken away by greed and injustice and violence. He speaks up about the ways that he sees the community and those in power, including religious leaders and pastors, choosing the wealthy and the powerful of the world over the poor and the widow and the alien. He speaks up and invites them to imagine a very different world, a place of peace where swords are turned into plowshares, even when that doesn't happen right away. And he does so again and again and again, knowing that he's not seeing the results. That this community is not instantly changing its way and turning to God. It's not the same as Jonah going to Nineveh and everyone fasting and turning away. It's the people he'd most expect to change are the least ready to do so. Israel, at least during Isaiah's days, does not fully turn and relent. Instead, they keep following after their own idols. They keep seeking their own selfish gain. They see, keep forgetting to love and care and speak up for their neighbors. And through their work and through seeking other powers than God, they end up going into exile. They end up being taken over by Babylon. They end up seeing this destruction that Isaiah warns them about. But Isaiah's words are not in vain. Isaiah's words remain. Even into the time of exile, even when it seems all is lost, the people remember. The people remember Isaiah and the words God spoke to Isaiah. These seem to be words, especially to the post-exilic community, the community that comes back from Babylon, the community that continues in Jerusalem, especially through Jesus' day, that these words spoke so much to them, that they remembered them and cherished them, and it actually led them to new ways of being with each other. In Isaiah's words of judgment and challenge, there are people in the darkest of times who actually find hope in good news. They find hope that there are people of righteousness, that there is a better message out there, a message of love and community and justice, even when the world seems so against all of it. That there is a God who made us and loves us and is still at work in this world who is speaking and acting up for a better way. What is most amazing to me about this passage is that these words that Isaiah speaks, 
they're not just Isaiah, words we hear in the book of Isaiah, but we also hear them in the Gospels. These are words that Jesus of Nazareth, the son of a carpenter, will speak about 700 years later. And Jesus speaks them knowing that he himself is not always going to be heard or listened to. I think it's one of the amazing things that our Lord, Emmanuel, the one we worship and serve, was someone who was not always welcomed in his own time, someone who even with his own ministry was often rejected. Jesus' ministry ended in condemnation by the state and by his own religion. It ended with death on a cross. And yet he keep, kept speaking up, kept acting out for what he knew to be right and good and loving. Jesus kept welcoming the outcast and healing the sick and loving the unlovable. He kept speaking up to those in power, how our systems mistreated the poor and the foreigners and privileged the wealthy. He kept speaking up to include those from different social backgrounds and ethnicities and nations who who weren't always seen as part of God's beloved community. And even as the world kept rejecting Jesus, he kept saying, these are my sheep, these are my people, these are those God sent me into the world to love and stand with. And nothing will stop my mission. For us, in our world today, it so often can feel like the good we want to do comes up against huge walls. Huge walls of apathy, huge walls of indifference, huge walls of systems that are meant to kind of support some people and leave out and hurt others. Working to, and yet, I still see so many of you here in this place choosing to speak up and to act for what you know is right, even when it's not heard right away. The ways you stand up and speak out to make our city a place where our neighbors and children can be safe from gun violence. The ways you all work to make our communities a place where people can find homes no matter how much they make in their jobs. The ways you speak up against racism and against fear of our Muslim and Jewish neighbors and say, no, this is, this is all of our community and we are here as neighbors the way you speak up against war and violence in our world and Ukraine and Russia and Gaza and Israel and Sudan and say there has to be a better way. We so much want to speak out and so immediately want to see our world change and see results and yet so much of the time we are like Isaiah. That we, it seems like ears are stopped up and eyes are closed. And if we're honest, some of the times we are also those who stop up our ears and close our eyes. Our challenge for today is to keep speaking up, to keep acting for good and for love, to keep following what we know God has called us to do even when it is so hard. And yet there still is good news even in this very difficult passage. And our good news is that even when our work may not seem successful by the world's standards, that God is with us in it, that God is blessing this work, that God is filling it with God's Holy Spirit, and that through it God is shaping and changing us and making us more and more into the people God wants us to be. And at the very end of this passage, there's also a word of great hope. At the end of the passage, God says to Isaiah that you're going to speak up and the people won't listen. And what's going to happen to this community and land and people in it is it's going to keep getting cut down again and again and again until there's only a stump. And this seems, well, what is the point? And then God says, but that stump, that stump will be a seed. That stump will be a seed that will grow again. It will be a seed that will grow again into community and love and witness and good news and welcome and truth. For you who are here, I know your words of action, your words and your actions, they are seeds. For you who are parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles, 
I know that when you stand up and speak out for justice and do good in this world, it's not just you who sees it, but I know your children and your grandchildren and nieces and nephews, that you are planting a seed within them. You may not see it right away, you may not know it, but I know it, that you are planting that seed. For those of you who are part of risk and going out and speaking today, I will tell you that not only are you maybe planting a seed, hopefully for those in power, but each time you do so, you have inspired me and encouraged me as your own pastor. For you who have heard God's call, to do good, to speak up for justice, to proclaim a better way. It is not in vain, even as we face wall against wall. Today, may we know that word that we are called to be people who stand upright, who stand with God, just like Isaiah, just like Christ. And may we be people who continue to choose that way, knowing that this is who God calls us to be, that this is who God is as our Lord and Savior. And may we join with Isaiah in saying those words, Here I am, Lord. Amen. Please be seated. And at this time, may we give thanks to God, our Creator, Savior, and Sustainer, through our time, through our service, through our words, through our prayers. And this morning, may we give thanks and praise through giving of our morning offering.
Loving and gracious God, we thank you and praise you that you made us in your image, that you came to be as one of us, that you fill us each day with your Holy Spirit. Lord, you have given us far more than we can respond to with our own gifts and time, and we ask this day that you humbly accept this offering, that it may be a token of our thanksgiving and praise and joy for you. Lord, we ask that you receive these gifts that you guide them and use them for the work of your kingdom to bring love and life and truth and justice to your whole world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, on this weekend of remembering, let us raise our consciousness towards those who have lost their lives in war this year and every year. May the people of our land and every land experience respect, reverence, and reconciliation in the memory of those who have fallen. May we hear a call to build your realm where war is no longer necessary and peace is no longer considered unrealistic idealism. May we channel our pride and patriotism towards critical self-reflection concerning our ideals as a nation so that we honor those who have passed on by becoming the best reflection of your peaceful will in this world. Good and gracious God, we take a moment to lift up the names in our community, in our city, in our world, who are, who are experiencing hunger and thirst, fear and loneliness. And we also lift up those in our community, in our city, in our world who are experiencing great joy and new life. Let us take a moment in silent reflection, honoring those who have given their lives and who continue to live their lives in service. Keep us vigilant in our care and love for one another. Remind us that it is in building peace that we show true strength. Encourage us that it is in conveying love that we bring hope to the future. Compel us into serving others 
that we may bring your power to the weakest among us. We praise you. We thank you. We say all of this in the name of the Prince of Peace, our Savior, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. invite you immediately after the service to welcome David and Patrick and Suzanne and to the life of our church family. 
But as you go out, I want to share with you this beautiful blessing uh, written by Jan Richardson, made for Trinity Sunday, which actually starts first Sunday to ordinary time, a new season in the church calendar. In this new season, may you know the presence of the God who dwells within your days, the mystery of the Christ who drenches you in love, and the blessing of the Spirit who bears you into life anew. Friends, go in peace, go with hope, go with love. Amen.